Hello and welcome to the LEAD Center webinar on redefining home and community-based services, CMS guidance on non-residential services and its implications for employment. I'm Rebecca Ceylon, Project Director of the LEAD Center at National Disability Institute. The LEAD Center is the National Center on Leadership for the Employment and Economic Advancement of People with Disabilities. We're a collaborative of disability workforce and economic empowerment organizations led by National Disability Institute with funding from the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy. I'd like to ask my colleague, Nakia Matthews, to go over some details so that you can more fully participate in the webinar. Nakia? Thank you, Rebecca. <clears throat> Sorry, guys. Um, the audio for today's webinar is being broadcast through your computer. Please make sure that your speakers are turned on or your headphones are plugged in. You can control the audio broadcast via the audio broadcast panel, which you see a screenshot of here. And if you accidentally close this panel or if the sound stops, you can reopen the uh, audio broadcast panel by going to the top menu, communicate, and then choosing join audio broadcast. If you do not have sound capabilities on your computer or if you prefer to listen by phone, you can dial the toll or toll-free number that you see here and enter the meeting code. And please note that you do not need to enter an attendee ID. Real-time captioning is provided during this webinar. The captions can be found in the media viewer panel, which appears in the lower right-hand corner of the webinar platform. If you'd like to make the media viewer panel larger, you can do so by minimizing some of the other panels like chat or Q&A. And conversely, if you do not need the captions, you can minimize the media viewer panel. There will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. Please use the chat box or the Q&A box to send any questions that you may have during the webinar to either me, Nakia Matthews, or you can email them to Elizabeth Jennings at ejennings at ndi-inc.org, and we will direct those questions accordingly. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and that the materials will be placed on the LEAD Center website at the URL you see below. I will also paste a link in the chat box for folks to download the slides if they haven't already done so. If you experience any technical difficulties during this webinar, please use the chat box to send me, Nakia Matthews, a message, or you may also email me directly at nmatthews at ndi-inc.org. Thank you, Nakia. Um, for those of you who are new to the LEAD Center, our mission is to advance sustainable individual and systems level change that results in improved competitive integrated employment and economic self-sufficiency outcomes for individuals across the spectrum of disability. And we encourage you to visit our website at the link provided. And with that, I'd like to turn the webinar over to Serena Lowe, Senior Policy Advisor for Workforce Development at the U.S. Department of Labor's Office of Disability Employment Policy. Serena? Thank you so much, Rebecca and Nakia, and thank you to the entire LEAD team for their uh, tremendous efforts in preparing today's uh, wonderful webinar. It's my enormous pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to this webinar. It's clearly a very timely topic. We had over 1,100 people register for today's webinar, and we're extremely excited by the turnout and the interest. Um, because of such a large number, we did decide um, a, a couple weeks ago to extend uh, the webinar by 30 minutes, so this will end at 5 o'clock today, and that's to allow for um, additional questions from you all um, and uh, additional time for our speakers. Um, uh, we don't anticipate getting through all the questions, so we will be keeping track. It's very important to please uh, use the chat system uh, or to email your questions uh, to the LEAD Center staff so that we can make sure those get answered, if not in the um, parameters of today's webinar, then in the future. Um, 
to also help address some of your questions, we did share a number of resources uh, to all registered participants um, shortly prior to the beginning of today's webinar. They included two documents that our colleagues from CMS will refer to that have recently been added to the CMS HCBS toolkit um, and are available online. Um, our National Lead Center also put together a Q&A that really speaks to how the HCBS uh, final rule can be applied to facilitate um, uh, integrated employment supports for individuals with significant disabilities. And then finally, there was another FAQ developed by the Bazelon Center and nine other national disability organizations and has been disseminated uh, to their respective networks in the field. And we also included that as well in your materials today. Um, on, this, on that note, it's my enormous pleasure to introduce today's moderator to you, Ari Neyman. Uh, Ari is the president and co-founder of the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. And for those of you that are not familiar with ASON, it is an advocacy organization run by and for autistic adults seeking to increase the representation of autistic people across society. Um, in addition to this role, Ari was appointed by President Obama in December of, 20, of 2009 and then confirmed by the U.S. Senate in 2010 uh, on the National Council of Disability, on Disabilities. Um, additionally, he wears multiple hats, including serving as the co-chair of the Public Policy Committee for the National Lead Center for Us, and he's just been a tremendous uh, uh, resource and leader for the work that the National Lead Center is doing and for informing our work here at ODAP. Um, before I turn it over to him, I just want to really sp express my gratitude to our colleagues today from CMS um, who are going to be presenting shortly. Um, as many of you know, ODAP and CMS have been working very hard in recent years to support our mutual efforts to promote systems change that leads to the meaningful engagement of individuals with significant disabilities as full participants in the communities that we all live. And employment is a critical element of that. So we are thrilled to have them again um, as, as key panelists um, for our LEAD Center and really appreciate their time today. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ari. Well, thank you so much, Serena. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with such a distinguished group of panelists, and I know that we're going to hear a lot of really valuable resources and information today. Um, over the course of the last several decades, we've seen tremendous progress with respect to the greater integration of people with disabilities in society. Since 1960 to the present, um, almost 200 institutions for people with developmental disabilities have been closed and their residents supported in community living settings. We've also seen significant progress in transitioning people with physical disabilities and seniors out of nursing homes, people with psychiatric disabilities out of IMDs. Um, and in recent years, a growing body of advocacy and focus has looked at greater integration within employment and day services as well. As most of you on this call are already quite familiar, the new CMS settings regulation gives us an opportunity to look at not only are we funding a particular service through a institutional or a community-based funding stream, but what are the actual characteristics of services being delivered in a particular setting and the lived experiences for people with disabilities receiving day employment, residential, or other forms of services within those contexts. Through the use of the HCBS settings final rule, we have a unique opportunity over the course of the next five years to bring um, the scope of what is now funded as home and community-based in line with the values, principles, um, and now standards um, that define what home and community base truly means. And in light of that, I'd like to introduce two of our distinguished speakers from CMS to really take us through that process and speak to what the rule means from the perspective of the agency charged with implementing it. 
Ralph Lawler serves as director of the Division of Long-Term Services and Supports for CMS. And Ralph has been a uh, vocal voice and presenter on issues associated with this rule for some time now. And Colleen Garuder um, has also been a key subject matter resource on employment within the disabled and elderly health programs groups employment team for CMS for a number of years. They've both been absolutely critical in the implementation and oversight of this rule. And Ralph, Colleen, please take it away. This is Ralph Fowler. Um, I'm really happy to have the invitation to participate. Um, I will uh, be clear up front that I have a uh, engagement that I have to leave for at 4 o'clock, um, but we appreciate the opportunity to discuss the final rule for Medicaid HCBS um, and to give you information specifically on how it um, impacts on um, non-residential facilities uh, nationwide. So there are a number of Medicaid authorities that support employment and have supported employment for quite some time. There is the 1915C Home and Community-Based Waiver Services. There is the 1915I State Plan Option for Home and Community-Based Services. The 1915J, which is a self-directed option inside of the state plan. The 1915K, which is Community First Choice, also a state plan service, and 1115 demonstration models. So, um, we began on a journey that took approximately eight years to publish a regulation that actually defined what home and community based meant to individuals receiving services, what it felt like, what it looked like. Um, that uh, regulation was published on January 16th of 2014, and as you can see from the title, it included a number of different things. The most important of which um, for today's conversation would be the inclusion of settings requirements for 1915K, 1915I, and 1915C. I will say, though, that this rule is um, very robust and has a lot of different um, aspects to it. Uh, so individuals who are interested in the rule as a whole should um, access the rule and um, any of the trainings or PowerPoints or toolkit that we put out on it. Okay. I seem to be frozen. Can somebody move the slide for me? Thank you. So we're going to go through a quick refresher of what the intents and key highlights are that are relevant to um, employment. The intent of the final rule was to ensure individuals receiving long-term care services and supports through HCBS programs in the 1915K, 1915C, or 1915I Medicaid authorities have full access to the benefits of community living and the opportunity to receive services in the most integrated settings that are appropriate to the individual. The, it also was to enhance both the quality of home and community-based services and to provide protections, additional protections to participants. Go ahead. So, the rule defines, describes, and aligns home and community-based settings across three Medicaid authorities. So, in any of these authorities, the settings should be the same and appear the same. It defines person-centered planning requirements for persons in home and community-based settings under the 1915C and 1915I authorities. The 1915K rule was published prior to this rule with um, regard to everything but the settings that was published in this rule. However, the 1915K is brought into compliance with the 1915C and I, uh, which developed further through our learnings and comments. Um, 
and will be brought into compliance through subregulatory guidance. It also is the rule that implements the 1915I regulation. Move forward. The other aspects of the rule that I told you about, um, I'm going to run through quickly. It provides the option to combine multiple target populations in one 1915C, um, which is useful to states that are um, uh, providing services to multiple populations, but they are the same services and the same providers. It provides CMS with additional compliance options, so it is no longer a situation where CMS must shut down a waiver that is not compliant. It gives options short of closing a waiver that will assist the state in bringing the waiver into compliance with the regulatory uh, stipulations. It establishes a five-year renewal cycle to allow concurrent authorities. So previous to this, the 1915B, which was the management uh, managed care overlay often to a 1915C, had to be approved every 10 years. The C uh, renewed every, ten, every two years, the C every five years. So if all the stars were in alignment, you would have concurrent authorities authorized together every 10 years. Um, that's uh, assuming that the B and the C were approved together. This allows for the alignment, which corrects a lot of issues that states were uh, dealing with prior to the approval of this regulation. It also includes a provider payment reassignment um, that is not specifically germane to the discussion today. We can move forward. Next slide. Okay. Um, when we originally, eight, approximately eight years before this uh, rule was finally um, published, uh, we defined home and community-based services in the initial NPRM as settings that weren't institutional. Um, we received a significant amount of public comments on the last I and C alone, over 2,000 comments, um, that guided us in how we interpreted this. So anybody who tells you that commenting on, um, uh, on proposals uh, doesn't work, I would tell you that this uh, rule was crafted based on the input we received from all of you. Um, home and community-based settings requirement are outcome-oriented, and it has everything to do with the nature and quality of the individual's experience in that setting. The requirement maximizes opportunities to have access to the benefits of community living and opportunities to receive services in the most integrated setting. Can we move forward? What is a home and community-based setting? It's integrated in and supports access to the greater community. It provides opportunities to seek employment and work in competitive integrated settings to engage in community life and to control personal resources. So it calls out the ability to seek employment as one of the aspects uh, that an individual um, should experience. It ensures the individual receives services in the community to the same degree of access as individuals not receiving Medicaid home and community-based services. A fairly high bar, and the bar we've established um, a number of places in the rule. Move forward. It also includes person-centered planning service plans. It requires them to document the options based on the individual's needs, preferences, and for residential settings, the individual's resources. It optimizes individual initiative, autonomy, and independence in making life choices, and it facilitates individual choice regarding services, supports, and who provides them. That gets down to the basis of settings, folks. Settings which are presumed not to be home and community-based. I'm going to say settings, um, institutional settings, IMDs, 
ICFIIDs, um, hospitals and nursing facilities are all institutional settings. They are not home and community-based settings. In addition to that, there are settings that are presumed not to be home and community-based. Those settings include settings in a publicly or privately owned facility providing inpatient treatment, settings on the grounds of or adjacent to a public institution, and settings with the effects of isolating individuals from the broader community of individuals not receiving Medicaid HCBS. And I'll take one second here to be clear about this. Those settings don't just isolate individuals with disabilities or individuals who are elderly. They isolate all of us, anyone in the general community from them. We do not have the ability to grow, to understand, nor do we have the full resources that we should have in our community as long as individuals remain isolated. Settings presumed not to be home and community-based cannot be included in a 1915C I or K program unless the state submits evidence. That includes public input demonstrating that the setting does have the qualities of a home and community-based setting and does not have the qualities of an institution. So there are two hurdles there um, that the state must um, uh, cross over in order to uh, submit credible evidence. The secretary must find, based on a heightened scrutiny review of that evidence, that the setting meets the requirements for home and community-based and does not have the qualities of an institution. And those are um, the significant aspects that we look for. With regard to person-centered service plans, the final rule included changes to the requirements regarding person-centered service plans. They are identical for the C and the I, and the person-centered service plan must be developed through a person-centered planning process. Go ahead. The person-centered planning process is driven by the individual and includes people chosen by the individual. It provides necessary information and support to the individual to ensure the individual directs the process to the maximum extent possible. It's timely and occurs at times and locations of convenience to the individual. It reflects cultural considerations. It includes strategies for solving disagreements. The bottom line on this, folks, you should be hearing the word over and over again individual. It is centered, focus, and revolves around the individual that the plan concerns. It offers choice to the individual regarding the services and supports. It provides methods to request updates. It's conducted to reflect what is important to the individual, to ensure delivery of services in a manner reflecting personal preferences, ensuring health and welfare. And let's be clear. If the process of delivering service doesn't reflect the personal preference of the individual, the individual's ability to benefit from them, and in fact, the individual's ability to desire or to find the services beneficial is compromised. It identifies the strengths, preferences, and needs and the desired outcomes of the individual. It may include, services can be self-directed, and it includes individually identified goals and preferences that have a relationship to relationships, community participation, employment, income and savings, healthcare and wellness, education and others. So it's the aspects that we've already highlighted in the qualities are again reflected in how the person-centered plan should be conducted and drawn out. <laughs> It includes services that are planned and purchased under the direction and control of the individual if they're self-directed. It includes amount, duration, scope, provider, and location. Person-centered service plan meets additional requirements when the individual chooses to direct some or all of their services. And person-centered service plans specify employer authority, limits to authority, and parties responsible for functions outside the individual authority. So again, it clearly establishes for the individual how those services will be laid out and will be rendered. Next slide.
Okay. CMS, over the course of the last year since the publication of Rule, has worked diligently on creating a toolkit and additional guidance for states and for individuals interested in understanding how home and community-based services will be actualized in the states. And the piece here I want to clearly highlight that we, um, that I think is missing in the slides is this. States have a transition period of up to five years from March 17th to 2014 to evaluate the current settings in their state and to bring those settings in compliance with the regulation and or to allow individuals to access settings that are compliant with the regulation. So the message needs to be very clear that individuals are not losing services today. We are not closing settings today. That there is a five-year transition period. States submitted statewide transition plans for all 1915C and 1915I programs on March 17th of 2015, were required by March 17th of 2015 to submit statewide transition plans. So the message we want to be clear about here is there is a transition period. Settings that exist today may exist four years from now in a different format or be um, uh, have evolved into settings that meet the qualities um, over time. So it is not, um, we want to quell uh, uh, any panic with regard to individuals understanding that services are being pulled out from under them immediately. Okay, next slide. The purpose of the toolkit is to assist states in coming into compliance um, over that transition period. Next slide. So the compliance toolkit includes a summary of regulatory requirements, schematic drawings of heightened scrutiny, a HCBS 1915C compliance flowchart, uh, guidance on settings that isolate as referenced in the regulation and as you heard me talk about in settings presumed not to be home and community based or institutional in nature. Go ahead. The statewide transition plan toolkit, which um, moves the states towards alignment with HCBS settings over a period of up to five years um, and you have the site for where you can find that. Um, a basic element review tool for statewide transition plans and HCBS content review tool for statewide transition plans. So there are pieces here that show the state how to set that up. Exploratory questions for residential settings and non-residential settings and questions and answers regarding home and community-based settings, including questions specific to non-residential. Next slide. Colleen um, Garuder, who uh, is a staff member in the Division of Long-Term Services and Supports, will walk you through the exploratory questions now. Colleen? Okay, hi. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, the the non-residential home and community-based settings exploratory questions are uh, meant to be a tool that is optional to state. Um, it's not a mandatory checklist that states need to use. It's just an, um, an optional tool to help you sort of think through what your um, settings look like and um, what you may need to do to help your settings become compliant with the new uh, law. So what you have in front of you um, is a link to the the exploratory questions, which we recommend actually that you look at all of the tools that Ralph just reviewed um, and not just the non-residential settings exploratory questions in isolation because the, the toolkit sort of builds upon itself and helps you to sort of think through the entire process of how you're going to do the assessment. Um, so 
in the toolkit, what you'll find is in the exploratory questions, what we've done is we've um, outlined the specific regulatory citation, and under the citation, we've included several examples of questions that we'd like for you to consider as you uh, evaluate your non-residential settings. And when I say non-residential settings, um, let me give you a few examples, um, because this has oftentimes become um, a question that people have asked. We're talking about pre-vocational services, day habilitation, employment, supported employment, um, clinics, um, psychosocial day programs, um, uh, uh, senior centers, adult daycare centers. Um, so those are just some examples to give you. So as you're thinking through these questions, think in terms of the, the setting that, that you are supporting people in. And the other thing is that um, in these exploratory questions, as we go through the rule, um, we're looking to make sure that individuals' experience in the setting is just as important as the physical setting or physical plant itself. Um, so we're really focused highly on the individual's experience in the setting. So for the first um, rule, uh, I'm sorry, first um, section, it talks about the setting is integrated in and fully supports access of individuals receiving Medicaid HDBS to the greater community, including opportunities to seek employment and work in competitive integrated settings, engage in community life, control personal resources, and receive services in the community to the same degree of access as individuals not receiving Medicaid HCBS. So I'm just going to pull out a couple of the questions to give you as examples. Does the setting afford individuals the opportunity to focus on needs and desires of the individual and provide the opportunity for individual growth? Um, does the setting afford opportunities for individuals to have knowledge of or access to information regarding age-appropriate activities, including competitive work, shopping, attending religious services, medical appointments, dining out, et cetera, outside of the setting? And who in the setting will facilitate the support access to these activities. Um, is the setting in the community in a community building located among other residential buildings, private businesses, retail businesses, restaurants, doctor's offices, et cetera, that facilitates integration within the greater community? So these are just some examples um, of the questions that we're asking and what we're trying to get at here is what is the individual's experience within that setting? Do they have access to, uh, for example, if they're in a day program or if they're in a pre-vocational program, do they have access and information about different uh, careers that are available in the community? Are they able to actually go out and physically touch, see, and feel those uh, experiences in the community rather than everything being done inside of the building, the four walls of a building? Um, and I often use this. Um, this phrase, all you touch and all you see is all your life will ever be, uh, which is a quote from a Pink Floyd song. Um, but if all people see, hear, and feel is the four walls of a building, then they'll never have the opportunity to grow and to understand what employment opportunities are really available out in the community. So we just want to make sure people have opportunities. So moving on to the next one. The setting is selected by the individual from among setting options, including non-disability specific settings. The setting options are identified and documented in the person-centered plan and are based on the individual's needs and preferences. So here we're looking for um, does the setting reflect the individual's needs and preferences? Do the policies ensure that the in individual has informed choice? By informed choice, I don't mean sitting at a, at, at a team meeting, interdisciplinary team meeting, and asking the person, do you want to stay in the shelter workshop with where your other friends are, or do you want to work, um, which is not really an informed choice. That's a choice that the provider is giving the individual. 
but are they able to make an informed choice from experiences that they're having in the community? Setting options include the opportunity for individuals to choose or combine more than one service delivery setting or type of HCBS in any given day or week. So for example, we know that not all jobs are from nine to five, and some people may need support during the, the time that they're not working. Um, and so do individuals have the opportunity to then combine competitive employment with community hub location, for example? And this may make uh, providers and states take pause and think about the way their rate setting structures are set up um, in terms of do you allow for monthly or daily billing, which may restrict people's options to choose more than one service in a day or in a week. But we're just looking that people have the opportunity here. The setting ensures an individual's right to privacy, dignity, and respect, and freedom from coercion and restraint. So we're asking that all information about individuals is kept private. Um, so for example, do staff and providers follow confidentiality practices and policies? Does the staff within the setting ensure that, if, for example, there are no posted schedules of individuals for PT, OT, medications, restricted diets, et cetera, in a general open area. We oftentimes find that in facility-based settings. So we're looking to make sure that that's not the case any longer, um, that people have um, dignity of respect and privacy. Does the setting support individuals who need assistance with their personal appearance to appear as they desire? And is the personal assistance provided in, the, in private as appropriate? So we don't want a staff member calling out a person because they forgot to shave or forgot to bathe, perhaps in the middle of a floor of a work floor that uh, where work is being done. Um, we much prefer that they do that in the privacy of a bathroom or another closed facility um, where it's you know a private conversation. Does the setting assure that staff interact and communicate with individuals respectfully and in a manner in which the person would like to be addressed? And I would have to question this in a lot of settings that we've seen. Um, the individual is of utmost importance. They're the reason why we do what we do. And they need to be included in all discussions about them, around them, um, and addressed just like you or I would like to be addressed. Um, the settings requirement assure that um, the individual or representative is grant, granted informed consent prior to the use of restraints or, and or restrictive interventions and document these interventions in the person center plan. You'll note that the person center plan um, section has a few more um, details in it with regards to uh, restraints and other restrictive interventions, so you might want to take note of that. Does the setting policy ensure that each individual support plan plans and address behavioral needs are that are specific to the individual and are not the same as everyone else in the setting? Everyone's different. Their person-centered plans and their behavior plans should be different according to the individual. So moving on, does the setting optimize but does not regiment individual initiative, autonomy, and independence? in making life choices, including but not limited to daily activities, physical environment, and with whom to interact. So as simple as the setting itself, are there gates, Velcro strips, locked doors, fences, or other barriers preventing individuals' entrance and or exit from certain areas of the setting? Does the setting afford a variety of meaningful non-work activities that are responsive to the goals, interests, and needs of the individual? Does the physical environment support a variety of individual goals and needs? So for example, does the setting provide indoor and outdoor gathering spaces? Does the setting provide for larger group activities? Does the setting afford opportunities for individuals to tune with whom they like to do activities in the setting or outside of the setting? Or are they assigned to a certain group of people? Does the setting allow for individuals to have meals and snacks at a time and place of their choosing? 
or is it regimented? Does the setting afford the opportunity for tasks and activities matched to individual skills, abilities, and desires? And again, that needs to be an informed choice. And lastly, the setting facilitates individual choice regarding services and support and who provides them. Was the individual provided a choice regarding services, provider, and setting, and the opportunity to visit each of those and understand the options? Oftentimes not. Does the setting afford individuals an opportunity to regularly and periodically update or change their preferences? You know that people, just like everybody else in America, changes their mind on a dime. And um, maybe they like their job today, but tomorrow they don't like their job. Or um, they like the uh, environment that they're working in one day, and the next day they say they want to work outside instead of inside. So we have to be flexible to meet um, people's change in preferences as they occur. Does staffing ensure that people are supported to make decisions and exercise the autonomy to the greatest extent possible? And does the policy ensure that the individual is supported in developing plans to support his or her preferences? Is the staff knowledgeable about the capabilities, interests, preferences, and needs of individuals? So anybody from the state or if you have your case managers out doing settings reviews for you or if you have family members or individuals receiving services that are doing the settings reviews for you, at any time you should be able to walk up to a staff member and ask about the capabilities, interests, preferences, and needs of the individual working that they're working with. So that is a real quick um, snapshot of what the um, exploratory questions for non-residential services look like. So let me just again emphasize that as you are uh, assessing your settings, you should not do it in isolation and just use this um, document that we just reviewed, but really you ought to look at all of the materials that are available in the toolkit because they build upon one another. In fact, I'll interrupt here to say, um, if you read the beginning of the exploratory questions in the toolkit, it references several other documents in the toolkit and guides you to them. So the toolkit should be taken as a whole, as an assistance in um, determining uh, what is and what will be able to become home and community based over the course of the next um, now four years. Um, I would underscore again that you will have seen through the exploratory questions and what we've discussed currently that there is no specific prohibition against any setting or any type of service, but rather a requirement that the qualities of life the person experiences in that setting meet the quality expectations delineated in the rule. Well, thank you, Colleen, Ralph, for a very informative and comprehensive overview of the settings regulation and relevant questions for states and providers to be considering within the context of their implementation today in employment services. I'd like to ask you each a few questions. And Ralph, if you wouldn't mind leading things off, I know you have to leave us in about 15 minutes, so we would certainly benefit from your expertise. Um, our first question is, can states set higher standards around employment and day services? than the standard required by the regulation. For example, could a state decide to prohibit facility-based pre-vocational services? Um, the regulation requires a minimum standard. A state can certainly set a home and community-based standard above that standard. They must, at a minimum, meet the standard delineated in the regulation. Yeah, that's very clarifying. Colleen, do you want to add anything to that? 
Uh, no, I was just going to uh, mention that as I've been reviewing document uh, transition plans and statewide transition plans, and we've been getting feedback on them, um, we've come across a couple of states that have attempted to um, set a higher bar, and they got quite a bit of pushback from um, their legislators, their governor, their um, constituents, et cetera, et cetera. So keep fighting the good fight. I mean, what the good work that you folks are doing out there on Employment First is really important. Um, but just know that um, that it, it could be a challenge as you move forward. One of the things that I, I know that many of us have seen reflected in um, those state transition plans that are moving towards a higher standard is a desire to comply not only with the rule, but with that state's larger Olmstead requirements. So that may be something for our attendees to keep in mind, that the settings transition plan may provide them with an opportunity to transition into compliance with other aspects of federal law. So let me go to our, our next question. Um, if a person is currently receiving services in a non-compliant setting, what would the process look like for them to be given additional options of services? And as part of parcel of that, um, is the state transition plan required to outline how states will um, replicate uh, or create capacity in compliant settings in order to replace capacity in non-compliant settings that is being phased out over the course of the life of the transition plan. For example, if a state is closing a certain type of day or employment service in a non-compliant setting, will the state then have to create new capacity in alternative day or employment settings that meet that state's threshold for HCBS? I think the answer to that question is, um, fairly complex, and it um, is uh, an answer that would be state-specific, so I will give you a general answer that says, first of all, um, that a state isn't required to close a setting. A state is required to bring a setting into compliance, so it is possible that over the course of four years, that setting will be transformed into a home and community-based setting that is fully compliant with the rule. In that case, um, and in any case, an individual's right to choose is clearly outlined in the regulation. It's clearly part of the person-centered planning on a minimum of an annual basis. Um, checkpoints should be established to determine in the planning process, in the person's planning process, that the person is where they want to be. Where they want to be over the course of the next four years will include all settings that the state has included in their, transform in their transition plan and that they are currently funding, where they will be in five years um, and over the course of this transition plan will be in settings that are fully compliant with home and community base. So there is the expectation and the requirement that in any person-centered service planning process that the individual be given full options to all settings that are or will be compliant with home and community-based services over the course of time that the transition plan is in process. I and hope that that. And presumably that would be speaking to some of the requirements of being able to choose non-disability specific settings as well. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, do, do you want to speak to any of the issues that you've reflected in your recent Q&A? I believe we've sent out a copy of that to the audience members, but is there anything you want to specifically reflect on or emphasize on the Q&A that you folks have put out on employment and day services? All right, give me half a second, please.
With regard to, um, first of all, I want to say that um, uh, one of the initial conversations we had with the state um, uh, with regard to transition planning was with regard to non-residential services. And uh, the question was asked of us specifically with regard to privacy other than separate bathrooms, um, what would be uh, privacy in a non-residential setting? Um, and we had a fairly robust conversation about are individuals' medications posted? Are they administered in front of other people? When staff are working with an individual, do they discuss um, concerns, um, learning uh, uh, processes, et cetera, with the individual in front of a group? Or is it a private conversation? If the individual has someone visit or receives a call, can they take the call privately? So what I want, what I'm trying to say here is that people need to think of non-residential settings in much the same way they think of their own non-residential settings. Certainly, if I am being spoken to by a supervisor um, and it's about an aspect that needs to be improved, I want that done privately. Um, if I am going to take a call, I want the ability to do that privately. I don't want people to know what my medications are or what my um, special diet uh, regime is, and that needs to be reflected in the lives of the individual we, re we serve, both in residential and non-residential settings. Um, so uh, with regard to the, um, we had some specific questions, for instance, about staffing ratios. Staffing ratios are not dictated. Um, by any program. It is something that may or may not be state specific and may be included in regulatory requirements. We did not opine them that, on that in the regulation. Um, will CMS provide service specific setting definitions? And there's no intent to provide service specific uh, guidance at this time. Uh, we'll continue to respond to questions from stakeholders, offer technical assistance to state, but the response to that is no. Does the regulation prohibit facility-based or site-based settings? No, it doesn't. The regulation requires all settings, including facility or site-based settings, to demonstrate the qualities of home and community-based settings and to ensure that the individual's experience is home and community based and not institutional in nature. So it was not the intent of the rule to shut down choice for the individual, but to expand choice to ensure that all settings comport with home and community based characteristics and that individuals in those settings will be experiencing that life. Thank you very much, Ralph. Uh, I, I appreciate you stressing that. I think one of the things that we've often discussed here uh, in the context of any number of different systems change efforts, ranging from deinstitutionalization to workshop conversion or more integrated day services, is that at the end of the day, living in the community implies um, a level of day-to-day -day choice and autonomy that is only possible within specific contexts or specific setting types. So, you know, uh, stressing that the settings rules about facilitating that kind of choice and autonomy on a day-to-day -day lived experience basis seems to me to be an excellent note to close on. Um, we, we need to move to our next speaker. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Allison Barkoff of the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law. Allison has been one of the leading voices in the advocacy community with respect to these issues, and um, in her prior role also served a critical role within the federal government on this and any number of other areas of disability policy. Allison Barkoff, Director of Advocacy of the Bazelon Center for Mental Health Law, please take it away. Thank you, Ari. Can can everybody hear me? Ari, can you hear me? 
for coming through loud and clear. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me participate today, and I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time today talking about this from a slightly different angle. And I know Ralph and Colleen just talked through the HB, HCBS settings rule and what it requires. I'm going to spend some time talking about Olmstead and what the ADA requires and talk about how the HCBS settings rule can be a vehicle and is a real opportunity for states to bring their systems not only into compliance with the HCBS settings rule, but also in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Supreme Court's Olmstead decision. Okay, I think I'm having the same problem as Ralph and this, the slides are not forwarding. Could someone, great. So I wanted to start from a values-based place and I think many of the people who are on the phone today we're all involved in the disability, um, in the disability service system and the disability advocacy movement because we really believe that we want to make sure we have a service system that has positive impacts for people with disabilities. So I just want to talk about from a high level, what is it that we want our disability service systems to help people do? So. One way to articulate the vision, at least uh, under the ADA and Olmstead and in talking to most people in the community, is we want to help people with disabilities live their lives like people without disabilities. I think Ari just articulated that. And we want to make sure that our service system helps people with disabilities to have real integration in their life, to have independence, choice, and self-determination, and it's not just about where people live, it's about how people spend their days, about being a real part of the community and building real relationships with people. And finally, we need to make sure that we have quality services that not only meet people's needs, but help them achieve their own goals. And we heard Colleen and Ralph talk a little bit about person-centered planning, and that really is embedded in Medicaid's requirements. And what I'm really going to talk about today is how the HCBS rule and Olmstead are a path towards this vision. So just to give a picture, today we're focusing on employment and day service systems, and I just want to kind of give a snapshot of where we are and maybe how we're not quite at the vision that, uh, that we want to be yet in our day service systems. So if we're looking across the country at state service systems for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Right now, only 18% of people receiving day services in the IDD system are in integrated employment. And this is down actually from a peak of about 25% in 2001. And for many people who are working, it's often for a limited number of hours. And what we've seen in data collected um, by University of Minnesota and, and ICI is that state investment in facility-based programs and community-based non-work is increasing. So while we may have a vision around employment, we're not seeing our funding yet reflect that. On the mental health side, we have a similar kind of picture. The vast majority of funding in state mental health systems goes to day programs, such as day treatment and psychosocial rehab programs. And according to the most recent data, only 1.7% of people receiving state mental health services are receiving evidence-based supported employment. And to state the obvious, and I think what everybody who's interested in pushing for employment really knows is that employment is key to meeting the system goals that I talked about. And why does employment matter? Well, it matters to help people be integrated into the community in a number of different ways. It helps people with disabilities have real access to the greater community. And it helps people build relationships with coworkers without disabilities um, compared to settings where people are only around other people with disabilities and paid staff. It gives people an opportunity, work does, to build new st skills and to really build up self-esteem and for people with psychiatric disabilities, work is part of recovery. 
Um, we know that many, many people with disabilities, their sole source of income is Social Security, and we know that being solely on benefits means a life of poverty. So employment helps bring people out of poverty. And most importantly, I think if you ask any one of us what we get out of our jobs, it's meaningful ways to spend our time, and that's incredibly important for people with disabilities too. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about what Olmstead is and how it can be used to further compliance in state's employment and day service system. So Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act prohibits discrimination in all services, programs, and activities by public entities. And by public entities, that's state and local government. And the Title II of the ADA has an integration mandate that requires public entities to administer services, programs, and activities in the most integrated setting appropriate. And that is defined in a really common sense way, and I think a way that if we asked anyone, what, what is integration, we'd probably answer it in this kind of way. And that's the ability to interact with people without disabilities to the fullest extent possible. Um, in 1999, the Supreme Court heard a case called Olmstead versus Elsie. And at that time, for those of you who do civil rights laws, um, you know, really it was an open question about the, whether the ADA was kind of a traditional kind of civil rights law that required showing uh, discrimination only by looking at people without disabilities and were people with disabilities being treated differently, or could it be about discrimination in and of itself against people with disabilities? And so the question was, is it actually disability discrimination to segregate people with disabilities when that's something only people with disabilities experience. And the Supreme Court held that the Americans with Disabilities Act itself does prohibit unjustified segregation of people with disabilities and that it is discrimination when public entities fail to provide community-based services to people with disabilities under the following circumstances when community services are appropriate, when people who are impacted don't oppose community-based treatment, and when you look at all of the budget available to the state and all of the um, services that a state is required to provide to others in the disability service system, whether the community-based treatment can be reasonably accommodated. And this applies to all facilities, services, and programs funded and designed by the state, not just those directly operated by the state. And it also applies to people in and at risk of entering segregated settings and programs. So what is an integrated setting? And I think one point tying back to the presentation that Ralph and Colleen had is I want to point out how similar and how the concepts of, of what integration is, um, you know, between the ADA and the HCBS regs are very similar concepts. So the ADA and Department of Justice guidance, as well as case law that's been developed through litigation in the courts, describes integrated settings as those that provide people with disabilities the opportunity to live, work, and receive services in the greater community. And I want to emphasize, in that is specifically the opportunity to work in the greater community. And some qualities of integrated settings are those that are located in mainstream society. They offer access to community activities when and with whom the person chooses. Um, integrated settings provide choice and daily life activities to people in those settings. And they provide the ability to interact with people without disabilities to the fullest extent possible. And Department of Justice guidance, as well as case law, has laid out a number of different settings that are considered integrated settings in the residential context, for example, scattered site supportive housing, and in the non-residential uh, context, supported employment 
in a mainstream job, so real jobs. So in contrast, what does the ADA say a segregated setting is? And again, much like the HCBS regulations, it talks about settings that have institutional qualities. And I want to emphasize that these are ORs, not ANDs. So any of these types of um, qualities could make it a segregated setting under the ADA. So congregate settings that are primarily or exclusively people with disabilities, settings that have regimentation and daily life activities, lack of privacy or autonomy, limits on the ability to freely engage in community activities. And we heard about um, that earlier from Colleen, a number of settings that, that really have those type of limitations. And specifically listed in the DOJ guidance is settings that provide for daytime activities primarily only with other people with disabilities. And again, examples include um, intermediate care facilities, that is institutions for people with developmental disabilities, nursing homes, adult care homes, sheltered workshops, and segregated day programs. And again, I want to highlight some of these institutional qualities are very similar to those that are in the settings that isolate guidance that Ralph and Colleen spoke of. So one question that's come up in the ADA context is, does Olmstead require states to provide a choice of segregated services? And there have been some cases that have primarily arisen in the context of um, states closing or downsizing some of their large state institutions. And people have attempted to prevent and stop the closure by bringing Title II Olmstead claims and citing the decision's language that says there's no federal requirement to impose community services on people who don't want them. And courts across the board have found, consistent with the Department of Justice's interpretation, that the ADA and Olmstead are anti-discrimination statutes. They were statutes that were meant and intended to address segregation of people with disabilities, unnecessary institutionalization, if you look at the preamble and findings, and that the courts say looking at that, there is nothing in the ADA the civil rights statute that requires states to offer segregated services in segregated or institutional settings. The obligation under the ADA is to provide services in integrated settings. Um, and courts have also found that there's, in the context again of closure on the residential side, there's no right to remain in a particular institution or in a segregated setting if a state chooses to close them. And again, that same rationale would apply if a state chooses to downsize or close a particular type of segregated day settings. I want to emphasize I'm talking about Title II and Olmstead. There may be other obligations under Medicaid, at least in the case of um, institutions for people with developmental disabilities. People do have a right under Medicaid to those settings, but they don't even have to be in the state. We have a number of states that have no public or private institutions. So again, what I'm focused on is, are, does the ADA and Title II require provision of segregated settings? And the answer is no, not in residential or non-residential. So I want to talk a little bit about application of Olmstead to segregated day services. And both the Department of Justice guidance as well as court cases have made clear that the ADA and Olmstead, even though it arose in the context of um, residential and, and actually a state-operated institution, it applies to all types of services, both residential and non-residential. And um, segregated settings, as I mentioned, under the ADA includes those that provide for daytime activities primarily with other people with disabilities. So that would include settings like sheltered workshops, day habilitation, and day treatment. And as I mentioned, integrated settings are those that provide the opportunity to work in the greater community, which includes competitive employment and mainstream jobs in the community. 
I want to touch just briefly on the progression of Olmstead litigation regarding day services. And so some of the earlier Olmstead litigation that was bought, brought by pr private plaintiffs over the last now 15 years since Olmstead, as well as early DOJ um, litigation in, in the last uh, five years or so, included supported employment services and that was to facilitate employment in competitive wage jobs and in integrated settings as part of a broader community services remedy in system reform cases that were focused on people leaving or who had been diverted from institutional or segregated settings. And this has both been in the context of mental health systems as well as developmental disability systems. So some um, settlement agreements that I can point to include Georgia, which had both an expansion of supported employment uh, in, in both the mental health and developmental disabilities parts of that agreement, as well as in Delaware, which involved the mental health system, North Carolina, which involved the mental health system, and Virginia, which involved the developmental disability system. So that was kind of the, the first iteration of uh, kind of day involved in Olmstead litigation. The next set of litigation was a direct challenge to over-reliance on providing employment in segregated settings, and these have particularly been focused on sheltered workshops, and as a remedy, seeking supported employment to help people work in integrated settings. And so an example of that is the Lane versus Kitzhaber litigation that has been filed in Oregon and that the Department of Justice subsequently uh, intervened in. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about Lane versus uh, Kitzhaber and the complaint as well as the motion to intervene by the Department of Justice, just so you get a sense of what the facts on the ground were, alleges that Oregon administers the state's employment, rehab, vocational, and educational service system in a way that people with disabilities are denied the benefits of the state's services, programs, and activities in the most integrated setting. So in terms of an allegation and uh, the findings around over-reliance on sheltered workshops, the Department of Justice found, for example, that 61% of people in the DD system received employment services in sheltered workshops, while only 16% received individual supported employment. Then it looked at, you know, what happened to people who entered workshops? Was that a short-term placement that moved them towards integrated employment or were they kind of stuck there for long periods of time? And the Department of Justice found that the average length of stay was over a decade and that some people had remained as long as 30 years. And then I mentioned that the Americans with Disabilities Act in Olmstead not only applies to people currently in institutional settings, but also people who are at risk of entering them. And so the Department of Justice found that there was a pipeline of students going from the school system into sheltered workshops that they weren't being prepared and provided meaningful choices to work in integrated settings upon graduation. And there was litigation in the court where the state of Oregon argued that Olmstead and Title II only applied to residential services, that this, there, there wasn't such a claim as, as bringing this kind of challenge in day service systems, and the court unequivocally rejected the state's argument and found that the ADA in Olmstead applies to all government services, programs, and activities including employment, which was the position the Department of Justice had taken. So after this direct challenge on segregated employment, there's been an expansion to look not only at segregated employment settings, but also at segregated day settings, such as day habilitation. And in these cases, the remedy includes not only expansion of supported employment, but also wraparound integrated non-work services such as mainstream recreational, social, educational, 
cultural and athletic activities, and I'm going to just briefly talk about the settlement ag agreement in Rhode Island. And just in terms of where Olmstead litigation is going, I think it's likely going to start challenging over-reliance on other types of day services, such as day treatment. So I'm just, the last thing I'm going to do is just briefly touch on United States versus Rhode Island. And the Department of Justice had a statewide investigation of the entire day services system uh, in the developmental disability system in Rhode Island. And like in Oregon, found a significant over-reliance on segregated day settings, 80% in sheltered workshops or facility-based day programs, why only 12% in individual integrated employment. Similar long-term placement in segregated day settings, a decade or more for more than 50% of people and a third for 15 years or more. And like in Oregon, a pipeline of youth that went from schools straight into segregated day settings and only 5% of students transitioning to jobs in integrated settings. The Department of Justice entered into a settlement agreement, and at least at this time, it's the first settlement agreement focused exclusively on Olmstead and day services. And um, it included an expansion of supported employment services and placements to people currently in workshops, as well as facility-based programs, um, as well as to students leaving high school. It set a benchmark for integrated employment of about 20 hours a week of employment looking across the system, and that people would be provided with the wraparound integrated non-work services I mentioned to make up a 40-hour work week, development across agency employment first policies, and in terms of transitioning systems, converging trust funds, there's an institute and technical assistance, and I think Colleen mentioned earlier, what does it really mean for people to make an informed choice all of the Department of Justice Olmstead settlement agreements, including this one, talk about what real engagement means, giving people the opportunity to look at other settings, talk with providers, talk with peers who have uh, moved to those settings. Um, so just briefly, what is the relationship between the HCBS regs and Olmstead compliance? As I said, I think the HCBS settings rule are an incredible opportunity to further compliance with Olmstead, a way to rebalance service systems that are heavily focused on segregated day settings, included segregated employment settings, and to build capacity to allow people to work in mainstream um, employment settings. But as I mentioned, the ADA and Medicaid have different standards. So so the fact that CMS says that a setting meets the HCBS settings regulation does not mean it is an integrated setting under the ADA. And while CMS's approval of a statewide transition plan means that it meets the HCBS settings rule, that does not mean that the state system is in compliance with the ADA and Olmstead. So my recommendation to states is to look at both obligations, to use your HCBS uh, plans, to, um, to really comply with both. And again, I think it's a real opportunity to move your states towards the real integration that we spoke about earlier and to help people be able to live in truly and work in truly integrated settings. Um, with that, I will wrap up and um, and people can kind of look at my slides. I think there are a few points about using heightened scrutiny and um, really encouraging your state to use high standards. And I will turn it over to Lisa. Okay, before okay, you thanks. do that, uh, sorry, before you do that, um, I'd like to see if we can't pause briefly and pose a few questions from the audience, particularly because we only have Colleen for another 10 minutes. I'm wondering, Colleen, if you could speak to this first from the perspective of the CMS settings rule, and then following that, um, if you, Allison, can speak to it from an Olmstead perspective, and Lisa, just from a broader policy perspective, if you can discuss how these considerations apply to enclave and work crew, um, as well as other group supported employment type settings. 
Um, sure, uh, this is Colleen, I'll go first. Um, so in terms of the HCBS settings rule, you would want to make sure, um, first and foremost, let me mention that um, our technical guide has been updated to include the information that's in the, uh, was in the former informational bulletin from 9-16-11, if people remember that informational bulletin. So that information is now in our technical guide, which is our policy um, with regards to uh, small groups and individual uh, supported employment. But in terms of the HCBS rule, um, I think that it's up to the individual state to determine whether or not that the setting that the individual is, um, is working in meets the HCBS characteristics and qualities. Um, it, it's going to be different. There are a thousand different scenarios that I could go through right now off the top of my head. Anywhere from working in an airport, which would be a very integrated setting um, and would be considered home and community based, to um, you know maybe working in um, the back of a warehouse or the back of a of a thrift store where you have no interaction whatsoever with um, the employees. Um, other employees and uh, customers. Um, so the sky's the limit in terms of what the setting might look like for an enclave or a group. But um, just just keep in mind those exploratory questions as you think about your uh, enclaves and small groups as well. And and this is Allison. I'll just say that from the Olmstead perspective, and we we look systemically at, at what's offered in the state and what type of opportunities there are for people. And the focus is on the most integrated setting. And certainly the focus in all of the um, litigation and the remedies has been on opportunities for individual integrated competitive employment in mainstream jobs. Now that doesn't mean that a system can't have some, some crews and, and um, group supported employment, but I think, again, when you look at the over-reliance on settings, if, if that's all that you have, I think that's problematic. And I would also say um, in the slides that I kind of ran through really fast, I think looking at um, the requirement that people be able to have a non-disability specific opportunity really lends itself to thinking about increasing opportunities for for individual supported employment and if someone is in a crew and only around and able to interact with other people with disabilities, particularly if it's a crew, for example, that cleans a building at night, I think there are some concerns both on the Olmstead side as well as on the HCBS side. Let me ask you just a quick follow-up on this. Um, we've also gotten a question with respect to individuals receiving employment services um, at a location in which they are competitively employed that is also a Medicaid provider that would not meet the requirements of the rules. So, for example, if an individual was receiving supported employment services in order to work at a nursing home or an assisted living facility at which they were not a resident and from which they were not receiving services, um, would there be any concern um, with respect to the settings rule um, if the supported employment services were being delivered in such a setting? Um, this is Colleen. Wow, that's a really tricky one um, that I certainly hadn't thought of before this. Um, I think if you were to, um, again, apply the setting uh, criteria and qualities to the job, um, the person, uh, you know, I'm just thinking about a nursing home, for example, the person, um, if they have the opportunity to uh, connect with other employees that don't have disabilities, with um, residents that maybe don't have disabilities, um, if they have the opportunity to um, come and go, to have visitors or to have lunch break, um, like they want to have their lunch break, um, access to food and that kind of thing. You have to really look at the, the settings qualities. 
very closely in the exploratory questions um, to get at that. But again, it's it's really about the individual's experience. So and not, and in this case, maybe not necessarily about the um, the institution that they're working in, because there are lots of people that work in nursing homes and hospitals and that kind of of uh, situation. Um, but it's up to the state to determine whether or not those settings meet the HCGS criteria. So just to clarify here, it sounds like what you're saying is that such an approach would likely be fine if they were hired and working under rules that were comparable to um, or the same as um, the rules of an individual working in such a setting who is not receiving Medicaid-funded HCBS. Yeah, I think that's, that's probably fair to say. Yeah, that's very clarifying. Thank you. Um, another another follow-up question, just and again, I'd like to direct this primarily to Colleen, but others should feel free to jump in as well. Um, one of the characteristics of settings that isolate are the co-location of multiple types of service provisions, such as residential, day, employment, or healthcare in a single site. Can, can you speak to why, um, according to the CMS guidance, that type of co-location increases the risk of a setting being considered institutional in nature? Um, I would say just by the nature of the setting itself, um, being on the grounds of or adjacent to, um, it, it certainly would lend itself to being an isolated type of, of setting um, that isolates the individual from their greater community. Um, and doesn't allow uh, access to the greater community. Um, so that's, that's probably why um, in most instances we've decided that if it's on the grounds of or adjacent to, it probably is institutional-like. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, again, it's up to states to determine through the heightened scrutiny process whether or not that setting is, um, meets our HCBS qualities or not. And, and Ari, I'll just add, if you were talking about not just settings adjacent to and on, but settings where they offer multiple types of services, I think the concern is that people will be there and won't leave that setting. So it's not like people go somewhere else for day services or go out into the community for their health care services and go to a different place where they live. If all of those things are in one place and it's primarily set up to serve people with disabilities, that the concern is it could isolate people because it doesn't give them an opportunity to leave the setting. So it sounds like the takeaway here is that co-located service environments are much more likely to be institutional in nature uh, and absent an approval from CMS through the heightened scrutiny requirement, that uh, heightened scrutiny process, states should move to phase out their use of such co-location. Um, Another yeah. follow-up question that we're getting from the audience here. Um, and I'm sorry, I've got to go, Ari. Thank okay, uh, Colleen, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks, folks. We're, we're hearing from a number of folks um, that there's concern with regards to adequate reimbursement rates in order to fund more uh, integrated forms of service provision. Um, Allison, Lisa, can, can you just speak very briefly, and then Lisa, we'll go back to your presentation, as to the requirements that both the settings rule and Olmstead put in place with regards to adequate funding for more integrated alternatives? Well, I can talk from an Olmstead perspective, and then Lisa, you can probably talk from a, a little more of a uh, a service system perspective, but certainly, you know, we, we when we're doing Olmstead settlement agreements, it's, it's really at looking at what steps do you need to take to shift your system. And I think as I touched on in all of these settlement agreements, we certainly understand that transitioning systems takes time and planning and funding, at least even if there's going to be long-term savings, there's short-term funding. And in order for services to be successful, there has to be the funding there. I know in many of the states where we are implementing more individualized services, whether it's on the residential or non-residential side, they're looking very closely 
at their waivers, at their funding, um, and ensuring that the services that they want and they're transitioning to are properly funded and are incentivized. And I think part of the problem is there's been a historical um, weight towards some of the segregated services. So again, I think it usually at the, there's the broad agreements under the ADA and Olmstead, and then it gets operationalized in a way that rates are a very important part of looking at that. Yeah, and this is Lisa Mills. I would just add that, um, you know, I work with many states around rate and reimbursement restructuring, and it just isn't universally the case that um, there is not adequate funding in the system. Um, as the former presenter uh, mentioned, that we still see most of the money going to um, non-integrated options or non-work options. Uh, but when you start to design models for integrated services uh, it, without buildings um, in small group staffing ratios and you start to look at individual supported employment, uh, doing that service well, engaging uh, natural support, using assistive technology to its fullest extent, um, and things like systematic instruction. It, when we measure cost uh, per hour people are working in integrated community settings, we're finding that that cost is pretty comparable to what we otherwise would have paid to place them in a segregated workshop and sometimes less than we would pay to place them in a segregated day program. So states are looking at rebalancing resources uh, trying to direct their funds towards the integrated options and developing new funding structures that support that. But um, there's been a lot of myths out there about uh, the cost of integrated supports being so much higher, and it, it just doesn't always play out like that in practice. Well, thank you very much. Lisa, uh, I think we'll hand it over to you now to do the rest of your presentation. Thank you for bearing with us. Okay, thank you. So I knew I'd be bringing up the rear, so I'm going to not say a whole lot. Um, but I did want to talk about the intersection of the HCBS setting regulations and employment first, because I am guessing we have a lot of states on the call who have a policy commitment to employment first or who may even have employment first law or uh, an executive order in their state. And the question has always been for me since these regulations came out, what does it mean for an employment state, uh, employment first state to embrace these regulations? What should we expect? And uh, Allison spent a lot of time talking about the ADA and Title II, and it occurred to me that this year we're, we're uh, celebrating 25 years since the passage of the ADA. And it is still surprising to me that it took until 2011 or 21 years for us to really embrace the idea that Title II and the most integrated setting mandate applies to employment and day services. And uh, as you did hear, one state actually challenged that in court and it was uh, clearly, uh, that argument was rejected. But my hope here as we look at these regulations is that it does not take 20 years for us to realize and really embrace the fact that these regulations apply equally to employment and day services. Um, there has been an awful lot of attention paid to the residential services, the aspects of the regulations that are address residential. There's uh, arguably a lot more regulatory language around residential. And of course, the guidance that has come out from CMS was initially largely focused on residential services. And so I just think we have to be clear uh, now that there is no um, difference here between employment and day services and residential in relation to the settings regulations. Um, both Colleen and Ralph encouraged uh, us to look beyond the non-residential exploratory questions and guidance to the other key guidance that they have put out through the toolkit. Um, and so I'm going to do that. I'm going to take you to uh, one of the toolkit documents called Settings That Isolate, which came out really early on in, in uh, after the regu regulations were published and um, is a short document uh, defining settings that isolate. 
In that document, CMS uh, described three unique residential situations that they uh, consider to isolate HCBS participants from others in the community. And I look at the characteristics of those residential settings as they were described by CMS and I believe that many of those characteristics may also be present in non-residential settings, and states should be looking for those characteristics in their employment and day service settings. Uh, and the things that were in those descriptive examples are uh, buildings located on large parcels of land, um, not easy to access the broader community once you are there, uh, so industrial parks and other places where um, it's remote and on the edges of community, um, where HCBS participants typically interact with other people with disabilities and paid support staff, where coworkers are mostly other people with disabilities and paid support staff, where daily activities are typically designed to take place on site, and as others have mentioned, people don't go out into the community. Uh, they do not participate in community-based activities, but rather remain on site. Uh, where multiple HCBS services are provided in the setting or in buildings that are side by side. Um, and where participants do not leave to access generic community services that may be available in their community. Uh, they also describe situation where visitors may, from the community may come to the site, but they don't come to see HCBS participants, and they don't typically spend any meaningful amount of time interacting with them while they're there. Uh, and that individuals' opportunities to experience the broader community may be limited to large group activities that are pre-planned field trips. So what CMS said in describing all of those characteristics in the three residential types of residential settings that they included in their guidance is that they concluded that Settings that have these characteristics do not facilitate individuals integrated into their greater community and do not have characteristics and do have characteristics that isolate individuals receiving Medicaid HCBS from individuals not receiving Medicaid HCBS. They also concluded that these types of settings typically do not afford individuals the opportunity to fully engage in community life and choose activities, services, and providers that will optimize integration into the broader community. I think some people were asking, what does it mean to offer opportunities? Well, here we see reference to the expectation that providers and settings optimize integration into the broader community, and therefore compromises the individual's access to experiences in the greater community at a level that isolates individuals receiving Medicaid HCBS from those not receiving Medicaid HCBS. So when I look at those characteristics, I think many employment first states are taking a long, hard look at their employment and day service settings. And if you use those characteristics as a guide, I think we have to think about um, what settings really need to change as a result of these regulations. Um, I think some other characteristics that are uh, of settings that are inconsistent with these requirements would be that people get to the settings on special transportation operated primarily for HCBS participants and other people with disabilities, and that people access community resources by using special transportation at times, and and they go to community places at times when other community members aren't typically present. So they may go to the bowling alley at a time when there really is no one else in the bowling alley. So as we think, as, as we look at states who uh, are submitting their final draft statewide transition plans, we see st some states, uh, I think all employment first states, making courageous moves around making sure they uh, meet the, both the letter and the spirit of the HCBS regulations. And so in these plans, you will find uh, one state that has plans to eliminate new admissions to 
facility-based pre-vocational services and has committed that all people receiving those supports currently will be supported to transition into integrated service options within the four-year transition period. We also see another state, uh, their final draft transition plan, uh, creating and implementing a new employment and day service array. Uh, they are revising their service definitions, uh, updating provider qualifications, changing rate structures to support integrated uh, community service delivery and career exploration for everyone of working age and then integrated uh, community-based wraparound supports. Uh, we all, also, uh, one other state's uh, statewide transition plan is requiring providers to develop specific and detailed plans regarding what changes and modifications they will be making between now and the March 16, 2019 deadline to assure that they meet the standards for the new settings rule. So instead of just asking them to assess their current practice, they're actually saying to them, we want to know what changes you intend to make in the next four years to bring yourself as far into compliance as possible, fully into compliance with the new settings rule. Um, I think that's, I would recommend that approach that when self providers are asked to self-assess, that they are asked as part of that to describe the changes that they intend to make. Uh, this state actually requires providers to submit plans, and those plans must address uh, how they will provide more opportunities for individualized rather than group activities direct, directly related to an individual's interests how the provider will provide more opportunities to develop relationships with individuals of the person's choosing, including people who are not part of that service setting, and how the provider will offer more choices and opportunities to engage in meaningful day activities other than in the existing service setting and especially focused on activities in the broader community. So the state is laying out expectations that just as they have to create a transition plan, that every provider should be doing the same. Uh, one state's compliance plan includes the following policies to close the front door to sheltered workshops by halting any new referrals to this service and to then um, transition everyone in sheltered workshops to integrated uh, supports, integrated alternative day and employment supports. Um, the transition will be to integrated individual or group supported employment. Either option must be paid at minimum wage or higher. And then also the availability of integrated daytime supports as a wraparound to employment because it's so critical for people not to experience a reduction in the overall hours of support they receive in a given week. The state has made a commitment not to reduce the amount of service anyone receives as they transition out of the workshops into community services. And the final piece of their plan is to phase out group employment settings that pay less than minimum wage so that they can ensure that all group employment pays minimum wage or higher. So again, they have a, a transition plan of four years to, uh, to make these changes. As Ralph said, nothing is happening. There's no light switch being uh, flicked on and off. Um, these are states putting uh, multi-year plans into place. The other issue I think that's coming up for employment first states with regard to the requirement that people have a choice of a non-disability specific setting. Um, the, the rules clearly require that the setting should be selected by the individual from among setting options that include a non-disability specific setting. Um, the setting, obviously, for any service is chosen after the service is um, selected and the service is placed in someone's plan. Then the setting where that service will be delivered is selected. And so the question has become, uh, when is it okay for an HCBS service for a state to offer a particular service, but only offer it in disability-specific settings? And in many cases, employment services, pre-vocational services, and day services 
those two types of services in particular, you may find states or very large areas of states where the only way to receive pre-vocational or day services is to receive it in a disability-specific setting. Um, the CMS guidance that came out recently uh, on non-residential clarified that services that are highly clinical or medical in nature may be appropriately provided only in a disability-specific setting. But they went on to say that they, they clearly did not include those, the employment and day services that we're talking about in, in their examples of what is highly clinical and medical. So um, pre-vocational services, habilitation, adult day, clubhouse models, psychosocial rehabilitation, they all referred to in the guidance as uh, services that could be delivered in integrated settings. Um, of course, the greatest HCBS setting standard for employment first states is the one that requires that all HCBS settings provide opportunities for people to seek employment and work in competitive integrated settings. That standard applies to all settings. There's nothing in the regulation to really suggest that that only applies uh, to employment service settings. Um, if you look at it, it is, uh, it's not just specific to any particular types of settings. So employment first states should really be thinking about what makes sense, what is reasonable to expect of providers of non-employment services in terms of their role in helping people um, uh, explore and pursue and keep jobs. We often hear that residential supports, transportation supports are not as focused on employment outcomes as we need them to be. And um, th this is really an opportunity to create reasonable expectations for providers of those other services to make sure they are doing what they need to do so to support people who may have jobs. And then people raise the issue about group support and employment. I'll just touch on it again. Um, states are looking at does the size of the group have the effect of isolating HCBS participants from the broader community? Um, I think CMS raised this issue uh, in, the two, in its 2011 guidance um, that group size could actually in, interfere with people's ability to interact with uh, uh, community members and coworkers without disabilities. Uh, states are also looking at does the time when people work or the location where they work have the effect of isolating HCBS participants. So again, as was mentioned, sometimes if people work uh, at hours when no one else, they may clean an office building during a time when there's no one else in the building. They may work um, at night when no one is around in, in, in the place they're doing the work. That those particular groups support employment situations may be a problem in terms of being uh, aligned with the spirit of the HCBS regs. So we do see states, employment first states, looking at um, group, reducing the maximum size of group supported employment. Um, trying to make sure that those uh, situations are more, are smaller and more natural and can uh, be, uh, ha offer more opportunities for integration, also provides better staff support. Um, and they're also looking at how can we make sure that uh, the, the types of work people do in group supported employment doesn't inadvertently isolate them. So four years from now, I don't know it, it, whether people view this as a long time or something that's right around the corner. Uh, we realize that some states um, uh, who want to make uh, changes, significant changes, are running up against the challenge of four years. Um, but it, I think it's really clear that because CMS built a transition plan into the implementation of these regs, they were saying from the beginning that uh, that they don't expect that states are in co compliance. Uh, otherwise, if they expected that, they probably wouldn't have uh, created the transition period. Uh, so um, while, while we've had a lot of talk about the el complete elimination of certain types of service settings, um, 
uh, I think what we want to make sure we're doing is uh, taking every opportunity to raise expectations and to achieve positive changes for HCBS participants. Um, so settings may not be eliminated, but that doesn't necessarily mean that substantial change uh, isn't still, it shouldn't still be expected. Um, I have encouraged employment first states to look at their provider self-assessment process and consider customizing some of the questions to the type of service that's being delivered. Uh, and as I mentioned before, following the lead of some other states saying, asking providers to suggest what they would change to bring themselves into full compliance so that there is an assumption that uh, compliance has not yet been reached and that everyone is expected to make positive changes. And then really states, I know states are struggling with the verification of provider assessments and the uh, work involved in doing that. But um, if providers are asked to suggest a plan for change and they submit one, the, the early stages of verification could then be focused on providers who say, we are in compliance, we don't need to make any changes. That's where the state would want to check out those settings and determine if in fact they are in compliance, uh, while the others who have proposed a set of changes, uh, you would be looking at that further down the road um, to uh, determine that they'd implemented those changes and they had um, come, brought themselves into compliance. So I think it can help focus the state's efforts around ver verification at this stage by focusing on providers who, when given the opportunity to suggest what they would do to make changes, um, say that they don't need to make any. So I will leave it there, Ari, and turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Lisa. We only have time for a couple of closing questions here, um, but I want to turn to the audience and circle back in terms of um, a particular question we have on transition. Um, to what degree do these considerations around the new settings rule, around Olmstead, and around new core service definitions for employment and day services impact um, transition services for students with disabilities preparing to transition into post-secondary service provision. So this is, this is Allison, and I'll answer, uh, at least from the Olmstead and a couple other perspectives. I mean, I think as I talked about in, in all of the um, Olmstead litigation that was focused on uh, day services, it not only was looking at people in segregated settings, but also looking at people who were at risk, and historically there has really been a pipeline from schools into segregated day settings. So I think it's incredibly important and, and Olmstead is gonna have a big impact there. Um, I also wanna flag, I know we're not talking about the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, WIOA, but there are some significant provisions there, Section 511, that create some real requirements that youth under age 24 be engaged and pre presented with real opportunities for real employment before anyone can go to um, a segregated 14C sheltered workshop setting. So I think those are both important. And obviously the HCBS regs apply to every kind of setting, whether that setting serves transition age youth or older people in, in the uh, in the disability system. So all the things we talked about today, I think are really reasons that are gonna push towards more real employment opportunities and integrated day opportunities across the board, but in particular for youth transitioning. And Lisa, just to, to add on to that, um, we have a question. What are some examples of non-disability specific settings for services such as pre-vocational or adult day services? Okay, uh, well, they are ordinary community settings. Uh, uh, many pre-vocational, where states are providing pre-vocational services in community settings, people may be in volunteering situations. Uh, they may be uh, attending 
classes or learning about work and learning about opportunities for work in their community. They may be doing job shadows or business tours. Uh, they may uh, be uh, at a local community college and uh, having a uh, employer come in and talk to them about opportunities. They may spend some time at the workforce center uh, looking at resources and things that are available. Pre-vocational services are really intended to help people with skill building around employment. And there are lots of opportunities to, to do that and develop skills in ordinary community settings. And uh, adult um, for non-work day services, uh, again, to their, any community setting where you and I would spend time is a place where people can be supported to engage in community life and uh, participate in activities. So the YMCA, the library, the gym, the um, uh, many, many places that community centers, um, where do other folks go um, in the local community? Uh, there are uh, typically opportunities, even in rural areas, uh, to, uh, for people to spend time in places where the rest of us spend our time. Um, and to those uh, activities fit well under the definitions of both of those services. And, and with the proper um, service model, uh, we can uh, create and deliver those supports in community settings. Final question to both of you. Um, you've talked a lot about courageous moves and, and the different recommendations you have for states. Can you talk about a few of the states that are undertaking these steps now and some examples of what is being done in specific state contexts that aligns with your recommendations? This is Lisa. I just want to be clear, the examples I gave um, are actual real examples from statewide uh, st transition plans uh, submitted to CMS. So um, those are those are consistent with employment first, uh, consistent with, I believe Allison would agree, consistent with the ADA and Olmstead. Um, and those are actual state uh, actions in regard uh, to bringing them into compliance with the HCBS regs. And I would say from the Olmstead perspective, I mean, I, I want to kind of be out there and say sometimes in being someone that is an Olmstead litigator and who's personally negotiated a lot of these agreements, sometimes uh, I think some of those states have been incredibly courageous and, and I felt like at many times we were working on a shared vision of um, where people wanted the system to go so I don't want to imply in any way that there wasn't a lot of courageous moves going on in each of those states, but we've now seen a lot of states doing affirmative Olmstead planning. I think at first people were incredibly focused only on residential settings, but now we're starting to see people really think about, well, how should we plan for our day service system? Where do we want it to go? We've seen some courageous budgets come out in, in states where they're really making some bold moves. So. I think between the HCBS settings rule and Olmstead and the Workforce Innovation Opportunities Act and Employment First, we are just seeing a momentum towards real employment of people with disabilities. People are really believing in that and, and we are seeing some opportunities that didn't exist at a state level even five years ago that are creating opportunities for those courageous moves. So we are now at our time. I want to thank all of our esteemed panelists and what I'm sure are our many esteemed audience members for choosing to join us today. Serena, um, I'd like to hand things back to you to close. Thank you so much. Um, what a tremendous webinar. I wish we had three more hours. I am sure the dialogue would have continued. Um, this is the continuation of an ongoing dialogue. I anticipate that ODEP and the National Lead Center will continue to provide these types of opportunities and access to our colleagues at CMS, but also to key experts like Allison and Lisa in the field uh, who are working with states to implement 
uh, the new HCBS rules with fidelity and integrity. Um, I want to thank everyone as well. Thank you, Ari, for being an excellent facilitator as usual. And I want to let folks know that we are capturing, uh, we will have this webinar archived um, and on the LEAD website early next week, along with all the supplemental materials that were sent in advance. Um, and we will also uh, be um, taking the questions that we did not have time to address and attempting through one or more vehicles to try to get those answered uh, to the best of our ability for, for those of you who had a burning question that we weren't, we, we, that time didn't allow us to, to really respond adequately to. Thank you all very much. And on behalf of ODEP and the National Lead Center, have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.